Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Sovereign over all the earth, the Wisdom from on high, our merciful Judge and Savior. Amen. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace, trusting in God's mercy and love. Generous and faithful God, we confess to you all the ways known and unknown that we reject and undermine your steadfast love. Though you made us your people, we treat strangers with suspicion. Though you forgave our debts, we collect without mercy. Yet we are quick to pass judgment on others. Have mercy on us, O God, and remember your promise to us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Through the living word, Jesus Christ, God forgives your every debt, your every sin, and gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. We sing of that Father's love, number 181, of the Father's love.
Now let us pray together. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life in abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we hear God's people. Are there any young people who would like to come forward for 
Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. You may be I think that this text would make a great summer blockbuster. I can picture it in my head, a great and good king of the ancient world, maybe played by Ian McClellan. His son, maybe Chris Hemsworth, has reached the age to marry, and the king has chosen on a beautiful and accomplished, kind and wise young woman, maybe Jennifer Lawrence, for his son. The marriage will form an alliance that promises the kingdom a peaceful and prosperous future, but the girl herself is someone whom the king believes his son will be able to truly love. It's all good news. The king invites his officials to a great feast so that everyone in his kingdom can celebrate the kingdom's bright future and share in the king's joy. But things go wrong quickly. The king invites his principal subjects, but they are greedy and power hungry. It would suit the first one, maybe played by Roland Defoe, much better if the king did not exist and he could rule his own small territory to his own satisfaction. So he disses the king and minds his own business instead. The second, maybe Tom Hiddleston, has secretly formed an alliance with a neighboring king who is more unscrupulous than our good king, and he is biding his time, expecting the wicked king to invade and reward him. Our third leader, maybe Benedict Cumberbatch, is in open revolt. He mistreats and murders the king's servants because he wants to become king himself. This story has all the elements of great drama. The good king understands, tries to understand why, even though he has been just and fair, he is faced with such wickedness and how to respond to his perverse and wayward subjects in a way that doesn't tear his kingdom apart. The son and his bride add that romantic element as they work to help the king and in the process learn to love and respect each other. The three bad leaders are dealt with in various ways. The king manages to replace the first two with good and deserving people, perhaps played by Viggo Mortensen and Emma Thompson. But the third attacks and only a terrible battle resolves that situation a battle that puts the son's life at risk. Finally, though, it looks like everything is resolved and the future is once again bright. The king, his son, the bride, and all our heroes are gathered together for a joyous feast. The hall is filled with the people who have been willing to respond to the gracious king's invitation. Those who have been excluded before by the evil leaders who are now ousted and disgraced. But there is a twist at the end of the movie. A man slips in, maybe played by Andy Serkis, who is not there to rejoice with the king and his son. He is there to assassinate them. The servants catch him, and the king has him imprisoned. But the king and his son both realize that rebellion is an ongoing problem, even in this good and happy land. So I think this parable could be an amazing movie. And if any of you want to invest in it, I'll get Pastor Chris to write the script. <laughs> okay, but seriously, Matthew wrote down this parable of Jesus for his community, and the church preserved it for us. And so now we need to think about what it is saying to us this morning. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And so I think it's fairly apparent who the king and the king's son are, God and Jesus. Where we fit in depends on who we are and perhaps where we are at any given moment. Originally, I think this parable had the same purpose that the parables we've been hearing in the last few weeks all have. 
Jesus is still speaking to the chief priests, elders, and Pharisees who have questioned his authority to act in the temple. And Jesus is trying to wake them up to the fact that the way they are currently operating does not honor God. Last week, he used a religious example. As Pastor Chris pointed out, everyone would have recognized the parable of the vineyard as a metaphor for Israel as God's people. This time, Jesus uses a readily recognizable secular example, a king and the politics of ruling a kingdom. But the message is the same. When God announces the marriage of the son and heir, God as the bridegroom and the people as God's bride is also a prominent Old Testament metaphor. The people who are on God's side celebrate and rejoice. But the rejection of Jesus by the chief priests, elders, and Pharisees shows that they are rejecting God and going their own way. I'm sure that Jesus is hoping against hope that they will repent and turn back to God. But he's also teaching the people that they should no longer follow these leaders who are going down the wrong path. Our society is structured very differently from the society of Jesus' day. No more kings. We elect our leaders, and with the way our media exposes every aspect of every person's life, I'm not sure that we even expect any more to respect them, at least not in every particular. In fact, sometimes we refuse a gifted leader because of his or her flaws and feel we must accept a less gifted leader because of his or her respectability. When we hear this parable, we are much less likely to identify with people, the people in it in terms of their roles in society and much more with their personality traits. So, are you being a chief priest or a Pharisee? Are you happy with where you are in life and would you rather God didn't mess with you at all? Do you feel like you are and should be in control of your time and your resources, that you have every right to choose what to do in your own little kingdom? If so, then this parable may make you somewhat uncomfortable. It may be somewhat threatening, as Jesus says that what God wants for you may be different than what you want for yourself, and that God really should have some say on how your life goes, given that God has given you everything you have, not only your abilities and your personality, but also your starting point in life, your parents and your community, air, water, earth, food to eat, the ability to gain strength from your food. This is, truly is our Father's world, and we are residents of it by God's grace alone. Or, are you one of the people on the street who received that second invitation? Do you hear this parable as good news? Have you realized that your failings and sinfulness and thought that because someone else found you or unworthy or put you down, or because you haven't been able to, to be the success that you want it to be, that you think God finds it impossible to want you? Are you hearing now that God really does want you? That God really, what God really wants are people who will come and rejoice with and among God's people. That God wants people ready to turn away from the things that benefit only themselves and turn toward God who wants abundance for all? Or, do you live in fear that you are that person caught at the feast in the wrong clothing? That somehow you're only pretending to belong here amongst these others, that you still might screw it up and have to be rejected into the outer darkness of death and hell? Well, I think that only the twisted history of Christianity has taught you to hear it in this last way. This parable was intended as a story that would make you examine your heart and repent from rebellion. It was meant as a call to action, not as a description of what happens when you die. And more than that, it's a story about the power and goodness of God. Those who refuse to come to the feast are counting themselves out of God's goodness. They are turning their backs on what is best for them and everyone else. But the parable also says that God is not ever going to accept this situation as final. 
Eventually, all rebellion and harmful self-interest, the shroud that enfolds all people, will be destroyed, and God's wedding feast, a feast of rich food and aged wine, will be celebrated by everyone with great rejoicing. The things that will be banished are not individuals, but the wicked and broken parts of all of us that keep us apart from God and each other. It will not be easy. Only God can do it. But it is God's great desire, and God, our great and good King, will not rest until it is accomplished. Pastures, 
beside still waters, on mountaintops, in harvested fields, along city streets, down country roads, and through all the valleys. Hear us, O God. Come near us, Lord God. Let your world rejoice in peace which surpasses understanding, at tables overflowing with good food and drink, and where the shrouds of sorrow are lifted. Hear us, O God. Come near us, Lord God. Let your people rejoice with faces white free of tears, minds unbound from disgrace, bodies free from suffering, souls restored. Especially we pray for John or Marcia, Darrell, Don. We pray for Caitlin, Margaret, Reed, Carol, Eileen, and Noel. We lift up our friends to you, Richard, Eva, and Bruce, Ginger, Timothy, Emily, Harold and Wilma, Jane, Connie, Pastor Tim, Shefali, Frank, Hope, and Pat. Be with all those whom we love so much, who are not here with us today, those who are traveling, those who had to work, those who are too sick to leave their homes this morning. Their names include Lois, Yvonne, Evelyn, Edna, Margaret, Ruth, Lois, Lydia, Joyce, Paul and Grace, Florence, Alberta and Sandwich, and Oscar. Hear us, O oh God. Holy God, we ask you to please bless these lap rows made by the hands of our whole congregation to bring healing and wholeness and blessing to Jerry and to Keegan as they both recover from surgery. Bring them back fully restored to life. And let this like it be a sign of your arms wrapped around them and the love of all people here in this congregation, that they may not walk alone ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, for all for whom we know and love who are sick or suffering or grieving at this time, we say their names and needs out loud or silently, we say to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, oh, hear us, oh God, your mercy is great. Trusting in that mercy and that goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. And the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to rise and as you are able and as you wish, share that peace with one another.
on this holy mountain, the holy, almighty, and ever present God prepares a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best meats and the finest wines. These are the words we were given this morning in our first reading. And this idea of mercy that God is continually showering mercy upon us, even in the midst of some of our hardest and darkest times. This is the place where we celebrate that God never abandons God's people and constantly opens the door to let them in to His love, His way. And today is a day in which the beginning of our whole lives can start. And we start that in a place of generosity kindness, giving, because God is the one that gives first. And so we invite you to bring forward your tithes and offerings in this time of love back to the God that loves us so much.
church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God, the glory, the Father of glory, Jesus Christ, our peace, and the Spirit of truth be upon you and remain with you always. Send forth by God's blessing number 712.